Farm Food Facts, where every farmer, every acre, and every voice matter. Welcome to the Farm Food Facts interactive podcast presented by the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance for Wednesday, January 16th, 2018. By the way, I hope you're celebrating this week. It's National Pizza Week. Today, our thought leader is Katie Brown, Senior Vice President, Sustainable Nutrition at Dairy Management, Inc. DMI manages the National Dairy Council, the Innovation for U.S. Dairy, and the U.S. Dairy Export Council. Katie is a registered dietitian nutritionist and has a bachelor's and master's degree in dietetics and nutrition and a doctorate degree in education. Prior to joining NDC, she served as the Chief Global Nutrition Strategy Officer and National Education Director for the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics Foundation. She was also responsible for the Foundation's Future of Food and Kids Eat Right Public Education and Community-Based Nutrition Research Initiatives. Today's podcast will continue to talk dairy as we have a discussion with Brody Staple of Double Dutch Dairy, an 800-acre, 220-cow farm that is at the lead of sustainability practices for dairy farms, and we'll be discussing the importance of food holidays as well as dairy nutrition. Let's get started. Katie, welcome to Farm Food Facts. Thanks, Bill. With 193 world leaders coming together in 2015 at the UN Sustainable Development Goals, goal number two was actually to achieve zero hunger, you know, ending hunger, achieve food security, improve nutrition, and promote sustainable agriculture. How does this impact agriculture's role in feeding people and fostering environmental stewardship? Oh, that's such a great question, Phil. Thank you. You know, the Sustainable Development Goals have created a global platform to address the greatest challenges of our time, which is feeding a growing world population while preserving our limited natural resources. Um, The SDG's 2030 Global Agenda, as it's referred to, calls on all sectors of civil society to work together for peace and prosperity for people and the planet. And as you said, Goal number two is to end hunger, achieve food security, and improve nutrition, and promote sustainable agriculture. And from a nutrition perspective, every country in the world suffers from at least one form of malnutrition, underweight, overweight, or vitamin and mineral deficiencies. And in many countries, more than one form of malnutrition exists. And this puts agriculture and nutrition front and center as key solutions. So goal number two, really gets to the core purpose of farming and agriculture to responsibly produce nutrient-rich food to nourish people while being respectful, responsible, and regenerative in our use of natural resources to preserve and nourish the planet too. No longer can people um, think about health as people of, uh, of health of people only or health of the planet only. They have to be looked at together. They're really inextricably linked. It is complex, and it does include considering four dimensions of sustainability, which is health, social aspects, environmental, and economic aspects that make up what we call sustainable food systems. I can give you a few examples of how these dimensions are relevant to consumers today. You know, people want to make food choices that are good for them and good for the planet, too. They want to know where their food comes from and how it was grown and raised, They have questions and concerns about how animals and employees are treated, and they want hardworking farmers and their employees to earn a livable income. And increasingly, they want to understand the environmental footprint of the food they eat. So in this growing discussion that is both uh, occurring globally and locally, people are trying to establish what makes up healthy and sustainable diets that are good for them and good for the planet long term. And I can tell you the dairy community takes its role very seriously. It's our responsibility and our opportunity to contribute to achieving the SDG goal number two. Milk and dairy foods are uniquely beneficial to nourishing people and alleviating hunger. They are the only food group, milk and dairy foods are the only food group that contains both high quality protein and calcium, plus other essential and important nutrients that contribute to healthy eating patterns. And the U.S. dairy community has a formal commitment to sustainability and stewardship. This has been in place for over a decade to mitigate our environmental impact. And informally, of course, farmers have always been stewards of the land and of their animals. And and for us, these are not just words. There are tangible examples of how the dairy community is 
continuously improving and, and trying to do better. Overall, we know that the dairy community is responsible for 2% of greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. and has made a voluntary commitment to reduce our carbon footprint by 25% by 2020. In fact, a gallon of milk in modern times uses 90% less land and 65% less water than it did about 60 years ago. This efficiency also translates to generating 76% less methane and 63% less greenhouse gas emissions. So Katie, on a, on a lighter note, um, with National Milk Day having been celebrated last week, how do food holidays like these impact the dairy industry and open up new opportunities? Are we getting the message out there to consumers? Oh yeah, thanks for asking that, Phil. You know, with people being removed from farms, but also really interested in learning about where their food comes from, it gives us, all, all of us in the agriculture community, an opportunity to inform and educate and engage consumers about not only the hardworking farmers and the nutritious products they produce, but also, you know, the, the fun and delicious um, foods that we enjoy every day and, and even on special occasions. You know, National Milk Day is a great example of a moment in time that lets us celebrate and educate about milk beyond the glass and to tell not only its nutrition and health story, but also how the dairy community is committed to continuous improvement and stewardship and sustainability. Um, on National Milk Day, we released a statement highlighting the benefits of eating three servings of dairy foods every day as recommended by the U.S. Dietary Guidelines. Um, the statement was supported by several trusted health and wellness organizations, uh, including the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, Feeding America, School Nutrition Association, Food Research and Action Center, or FRAC, the President's Council on Sports, Fitness, and Nutrition, National Hispanic Medical Association, and Action for Healthy Kids. And, you know, so we were really excited about that. And, and of course, coming right up is, is National Nutrition Month in March, which is another whole month dedicated to celebrating and raising awareness of the importance of nutritious foods for our health and well-being. And we can leverage this month, all of us in the ag community, to also talk about the important topics like reducing our food waste as being part of the uh, part of responsible consumption, and of course respecting the bountiful foods produced by our hardworking farmers. Well, Katie, thanks so much for joining us and sharing those valuable insights. And now the ag stories that make a difference. Solutions that could help feed 10 billion people without depleting the planet. Business Insider recently published a list of the ways that the food industry can continue to feed a growing population without increasing its use of natural resources. The most notable on the list included reducing demand for food by limiting food waste, making production more efficient in order to yield more crops, and protecting and restoring natural ecosystems by limiting agriculture land shifting. These solutions were inspired in response to projections from the French Institute for Demographic Studies, which forecast that there will be nearly 10 billion humans on the planet Earth by the year 2050. In addition, the World Resources Institute estimates that this will cause people's food needs to increase by 56%. While these figures do sound concerning, the World Resources Institute also suggests that we might be able to sustainably feed a 10 billion strong population by adhering to these suggestions of limiting food waste, increasing production efficiency, and protecting natural resources and ecosystems. What grocers need to know is that as sustainability and population growth continue to be wildly and more urgently discussed, Farmers and retailers can show their willingness to support the planet and deter world hunger by putting a distinct focus on reducing food waste and striving to keep ag production as efficient and eco-friendly as possible. Which leads us to our next story, which suggests that there is a way that we can massively produce food production. Fixing a flaw in photosynthesis could tremendously increase the amount of food that we produce. Biologists have genetically engineered tobacco plants that grow up to 40% larger than usual by overcoming natural restrictions in photosynthesis that limit crop productivity. 
A team of scientists is now working towards introducing the same changes into food crops, such as wheat and soybeans. The building blocks of life are molecules that are made of chains of carbon atoms, and plants assemble these chains from carbon atoms that are taken from the carbon dioxide molecules in the air. However, the enzyme that takes hold of CO2 often grabs an oxygen molecule by mistake, which generates toxic molecules that plants have to spend energy on cleaning up. Now, this elemental flaw has been called one of evolution's greatest mistakes. Grabbing oxygen by mistake, which is called photorespiration, happens so often now that it can reduce the efficiency of photosynthesis by as much as 50 percent. Scientists have been trying to find a solution for a number of years. They've now come up with a design for dealing with the toxic byproducts of photorespiration. Amanda Cavanaugh of the University of Illinois in Urbana said, what we tried to do was to reroute the entire process. The hope is that we can stack up these traits and get additive gains. The notion is that the methods used on the tobacco plants could be applied to food crops in order to significantly increase yields. What grocers need to know is that the efficiency of photosynthesis can indeed further improve upon crops, enough to actually create a significant increase in a crop's yield. This could have an effective impact on the amount of food produced, which in turn could have a beneficial impact worldwide. So with that, we see a possible way to increase food production. And now, here's a way that we can help protect one of our planet's primary resources, water. Smart agriculture could be the solution to water scarcity. It is projected that the agriculture industry will be increasingly affected by water scarcity in the coming years. Thankfully, a solution arrives in the form of smart agriculture, a network of technologies which can assist the world's farmers in utilizing the water that they use growing food crops in the most efficient ways possible. Minimizing water usage is one of the most important steps. Using water-saving technology to reach a balance between crop output and resource usage will also provide a means for feeding the incoming generations of people by conserving the natural resources that we possess. There are several areas in agriculture production where the collection of data can help pinpoint waste and aid in efficiency of applying water supplies to crops. U.S. farmers are already doing much for water quality and water conservation, such as drip irrigation. Drip-based systems are simple, yet they result in considerable water savings over surface-based methods of irrigation, such as sprinklers or furrows. Smart Ag also explores the new ways to maximize crop yields as a means of water conservation. Scientists are using ultraviolet light as a means to maneuver crop potential. This method has shown potential in igniting more productive growing cycles. For instance, seeds that are treated with the biolumic ultraviolet crop yield enhancement system have shown 22% increases in crop yields when tested. It appears that this UV light that's applied to seeds during critical moments in their early development has the effect of kickstarting those seeds' crop bearing potential. The use of this technology could be an essential new step in ensuring crops can thrive with less water without reducing their yield. What grocers need to know is that with water scarcity projected to become a larger issue as time progresses, agriculturists will need to continue to find innovative ways to reuse water and reduce overall water consumption. And the solution may be as simple as using data and new technology to keep farming smarter. And as technology continues to have a notable impact on agriculture and the food industry, online meat purchases are experiencing a significant uptick. Beef sees a rise in demand for high-end cuts, and it's online. Although it's reported that plant-based cuisine was one of the biggest food trends of 2018, it's also worth mentioning that beef sales were massive. Nielsen reports that beef experienced the largest change in U.S. sales over the past few years, with nearly 11 percent more pounds sold in 2018 than in 2015. And beef consumption is expected to continue to rise. 
Although 55% of the population still purchase their meat at full-service supermarkets, a growing number of consumers are moving to the Internet in order to locate more specialized product options. Online meat purchases have jumped from 4% back in 2015 to 19% in 2018. This is because consumers are seeking out high-quality product that is both sustainable and traceable. Cuts of Wagyu beef, for example, seem to be the highest in demand, and it's been reported that Google searches for Wagyu beef have more than tripled just in the past four years. Now, while many people think that Wagyu is primarily a Japanese export, American Wagyu has been around since the 1970s, when animals brought over from Japan were crossbred with domestic breeds, such as Angus and Holstein, and when we shop online, we can spend hours learning about each brand's minutia of animal husbandry, flavor profiles, and cooking methods. This is partly why the online market holds the edge over traditional supermarkets, where space and educational support is limited, and product needs to move rapidly off those supermarket shelves. What grocers need to know is that although plant-based proteins have gained popularity with consumers, beef continues to see a large upswing in online sales. And this may be a lucrative avenue for ranchers and retailers to explore further, especially as online grocery shopping continues to become more popular and acceptable among all consumers. And alongside the increase in online meat purchases, here are some food trends to watch out for in 2019. Six trends expected to impact the food industry in 2019. According to an article recently published by Food Dive, there are six trends that will impact our food industry. They say that in the upcoming year, both everything and nothing will be new in the food and beverage business. On to the trends. Food and beverages that contain cannabis, more functional foods like probiotics and plant-based foods, better for you on labels and in ingredients, plant-based meat sustainability pledges from large companies are all on the list, as well as more mergers and acquisitions of big name CPG companies and innovative startups. Millennials and Generation Z are especially interested in fresh, better for you foods that also claim to positively impact the environment, more so than previous generations have been, and their demands are changing the type of foods and beverages that we'll see in the food industry. What grocers need to know is that by considering these predictions for the upcoming year, farmers and retailers together can focus on producing and supplying foods that fulfill the public's demand and keep consumers satisfied, informed, and shopping. Coming up now, a discussion with Brody Staple of Double Dutch Dairy. Brody, this is a big month for dairy. January 11th was National Milk Day and Cheese Lovers Day is January 20th. What's the significance of, of these food holidays, if you would, and what effect, if any, do they have on consumption? Yeah, Phil, thanks for asking. Uh, I think that as a dairy farmer and in the dairy industry, we like to see days like this really pushed out. You know, a lot of people make their, their buying decisions uh, based on what they see on social media and online nowadays. Sure. Um, so we're really excited to see these things coming up. You know, I think that it'll, it'll definitely be a push for uh, some of the specialty cheeses and things, you know, people kind of correlate they, that as they go through the grocery store. Hey, I, I heard today was national cheese day. I'm going to go out and check out a new cheese or, I think it's an opportunity for grocers to to put their you know some cheeses out front and center, and uh, and really promote uh, dairy product. Yeah, there's there's no question um, about that. In fact, um, probably you don't know, but my grandfather is actually a dairy farmer, and I can only imagine you know back then uh, what. National Milk Day would have had on consumption. Uh, talking about you know these two holidays a bit, what roles do cheese and milk play today in a nutritious diet? As we hear all about the diets, it's after the first of the year. Uh, more people are you know lining up outside of Sweet Green and and other chains around the country. Um, so what what role uh, should cheese and milk play uh, when it comes to diets? If you go back and look at the history of cheese, cheese production predates recorded human history. I thought that was really interesting when I read that a while back because cheese has been around for a long time and the fads kind of dictate how much people 
mm-hmm. should eat or not eat of cheese. But it's been really encouraging to see the comeback of butter. I know we're not talking about butter today, but um, right. just whole whole animal fats has has seen a comeback, um, and it's it's encouraging on our end. Um, but also, you know, it's something that we've known for years and years that you know whole whole fat dairy is is a is a product that you know especially in kids, you know, they talk about the first few years of a child's life being so instrumental in, in just immunity and, and other, uh, developments. Um, and that whole fat from milk and, and from other dairy products are, is so beneficial when it comes to developing the, uh, the brain and, and several different, uh, parts of the, the children's body. But, um, you know, i I see milk is <clears throat> milk is proteins, minerals, and lactose. These are things that you can't find as a source in any other food groups. And also, Brody, you know, I've seen the research <clears throat> and I've read it where um, whole milk um, is great, you know, to, to satisfy our bodies when we're on a diet and that actually people who drink whole milk can actually lose weight faster than people who don't. Right. Um, and I'm not a scientist by any means, right? But if I can preach my, uh, my belief, <laughs> it, uh, it's really your body, it's not been processed for the most part. Your body can absorb it. Your body can utilize it. Um, and we, uh, we as humans need, need fat. Um, it's an energy source, right? And that's why milk is such a great energy source. It's, um, because it's, it's energy that we, that your body can use and utilize. Sure. Well, let's switch our discussion to, to farm practices. Uh, with all the new technologies that are out there, what advances do you see and are you using um, on your farm? Yeah. So um, we've, uh, I think it's been in for a year or two now. We've implemented, um, and I really like to put this out there because a lot of people have their heads kind of boil around this. Um, all of our cows on our dairy wear Fitbits. The Fitbits, like the runners wear? Like like uh, just about everybody that doesn't run even right. wears today right. because they want to know how many steps they took in a day and feel really good about themselves. Yep. So our, our, our cows, uh, it's not a, a Fitbit around their ankle. It's actually an ear tag. And it tells me how many steps they take a day. It tells me, so a cow is a ruminating animal. They need to chew their cud. If a cow is not chewing her cud, she's not feeling good. And I, so I have eyes on that cow 24 hours a day. And I know that if she quits chewing her cud, that she's not feeling well. And it, it alerts me way before I can visually see anything. There's also a thermometer in, in that ear tag. So it tells me if she's running a fever or not. So it really helps us to keep a really good handle on our cow health. Um, and also, there's some reproduction aspects that really come in there um, with efficiencies. And But really, it's it's on the health side that we can really reduce our use of antibiotics then because we can catch it a lot sooner and we can uh, keep that girl moving. That's fabulous. Uh, I had no idea that, that they're now, and I'm assuming that it's a special Fitbit. It's not the same kind that I would go to a store and buy. No, that's right. So it's designed for cows. There's algorithms built into it because it, it sits in her ear. So mm-hmm. there's a microphone built in so that it hears the click of the jaw when she's chewing. Um, it's it's really fascinating technology that, you know, it was, quite frankly, it was probably in animals before it was on humans. Wow, that's great. Um, I also know that you offer farm tours to both consumers and retailers. Uh, what do you hope to achieve through that? And, you know, a lot more than just, you know, having some friends come over and, and see the farm. Yeah. So our kids are in a school, a private school. There's 180 kids there, right? We are the only farm family left in that school. And oftentimes it's so fascinating when you talk to people in Wisconsin and they have conversations with you. Yeah. My grandpa farmed. Yeah. My great grandpa farmed. Yeah. You know, and there's so, we are, we are really two generations in Wisconsin. Just, I don't know what, about the rest of the U S but Wisconsin, I would say we're two generations already removed from the farm. And people have no clue how their food is being made or where it's being made. So it, there is such a fascination when people come out to the farm. And I, I can almost guarantee you that every time we have a busload of people that leave, they are so thankful that they've been here, that they've received an education. They can come out and they can see truth on our farm, despite what they might be reading uh, by some of the publications out there. <clears throat> um, but, you know, it's, it's, there's a sense of gratification on our end as well 
uh, that we can tell our story and we can tell people how things are actually done on a farm. Sure. I mean, seeing is is believing. Uh, so, you know, soil and water are critical inputs for our food supply and certainly for farms. Uh, what are you doing at Double Dutch Dairy to build soil health? So we've got several things that we've implemented uh, really in the last few years. Um, you know, soil health is a big thing. So for us, we're planting cover crops on our ground. Uh, it's something that we can, uh, as I look outside now, we're we're in our winter time, but we're getting rain instead of snow. So there's soil moving around wherever there's not cover crop. So we're planting co cover crops to a maintain soil stability so that we don't get soil moving around, washing into rivers and streams, but also to improve soil health. Um, you know, the, the more soil that we can keep in place uh, equals less soil erosion equals better soil health. And if we have healthy soil, we can improve our soil efficiency. Uh, which gives us a better yield on our crop um, in the long run. And and Brody, last question. Um, I know that being a dairy farmer is a tough business, especially these days as there's more discussion about sustainability. Uh, what are you doing to implement sustainability practices on your farm? So like we talked about, the cover crops is a big thing for us, you know, um, but really I, I can point back to the farm tours as being something sustainable right we need to be educating we need to be um, socially sustainable we need to be showing our neighbors our friends our our people in our area um, about modern day farming practices um, so that they're educated so that they are engaged and they want to be buying our product i would also say that the way that we take care of our animals and our soil um, I'm a, a relatively young dairy farmer with uh, four kids and I, I want to farm for them to be able to farm on down the road mm -hmm. and I want to be able to share a good story so that we don't get shut out of this business. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of negative press out there, right? And I want to, I want to be able to share a good story because I want my, my future, my family to, uh, to be in farming as well. So it's really, you know, it's, it's really educating the, the consumer public and, and actually putting your money where your mouth is and doing that, implementing those practices on the farm. Well, Brody, keep up the great work. Um, happy New Year to you and, and to your family. And hopefully one of these days I can get to Wisconsin and you can give me a farm tour. Absolutely, Phil. We uh, will greet you with cheese at the door. Terrific. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on Farm Food Facts. For more information on all things food and agriculture and to listen to our archives, I hope you'll visit fooddialogues.com under the Programs and Media tab and visit us on Facebook at U.S. Farmers and Ranchers or on Twitter at USFRA.